Good afternoon, everybody. So we're now going to have the chance to hear from three very experienced and accomplished humanitarian leaders who are going to share with us their own ideas about how the humanitarian field might evolve, what these possible futures might look like, and how we might put in place the conditions for a more effective, more efficient, and more locally led humanitarian system of the future. Uh, my name is Kareem El Bayar. I'm the lead of OCHA's newly established private sector unit, and it's really a great honor for me to share the stage today with three really remarkable women. So I, I just do apologize in advance for almost certainly butchering your names, but here we go. Um, I'd like to first welcome Minako Manome to the stage. Minako is the head of UNDP's Risk Anticipation Hub, where she leads a team that works to get ahead of the curve of future crises by mitigating risk and addressing drivers and root causes of conflicts, disasters, and other types of crisis. Welcome, Minako. I should mention that previously, Minako served for six years with UNDP in Syria, where she led the economic development and livelihoods work and was the deputy resident representative of UNDP in Syria. She's also held roles with UNICEF in East Timor and UNDP in Nepal. Next, I'd like to welcome Ms. Natalie Olishlager Jarsma. Close, okay. <laughs> Natalie is the Director of Stabilization and Humanitarian Assistance at the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And she served with the MFA for almost 25 years in a wide range of 26 years. My information is not up to date. Um, but in a wide range of positions, including as a diplomat in South Africa, Hungary, and the United States. So welcome, Natalie. Thank you so much. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Gemma Connell, the chief of OCHA's assessment, planning, and monitoring branch, where she leads OCHA's work on global appeals, develops guidance and policy on humanitarian program cycle, supports humanitarian leadership around the world, and promotes collaboration between humanitarian and development agencies. Gemma has close to 20 years of experience in humanitarian action, women's rights, and human rights, and played a key role in responding to complex emergencies around the world, including in Mozambique, South Sudan, and the Gaza Strip. Prior to her current role, Gemma served as the head of OCHA's regional office for Southern and Eastern Africa, where she oversaw humanitarian operations in 25 countries. So welcome to Gemma as well. I have to say, I was specifically warned before I came up on stage not to be overly negative here. We're trying to envision positive futures uh, for the humanitarian system, but I do think we have to start with where we are today. Um, and it can be hard not to feel pessimistic about the current state of the world, and in particular, the state of the humanitarian system. War, pandemic, climate change, political instability, economic contraction, all this is putting unprecedented pressure on the global architecture of humanitarian response. And as we heard already this morning, the number of people in need of urgent life-saving assistance has grown to a level not seen since World War II. Humanitarian needs appear to have grown almost exponentially. OCHA's Global Humanitarian Overview for 2024 calls for $48.2 billion to support people in need of urgent life-saving assistance in 70 countries. That's more than five times more than the $9 billion that was appealed for in 2012, just 12 years ago. Climate change is increasing the frequency and severity of many types of disasters, and we saw earlier this month in neighboring Germany, which suffered from catastrophic flooding of the type that used to be called once a century storm, but is now almost every year. More than 114 million people have been forcibly displaced worldwide as a result of persecution, conflict, violence, and disaster. It's the largest number ever recorded, and all this can feel extraordinarily overwhelming. So I want to start with a question about the current state of the world. And, and Gemma, I'd like to start with you, if possible. All of these negative statistics can really make us feel overwhelmed, paralyzed, and powerless. So help us, please, to make sense of these trends. And if you can, share with us, what is your assessment of today's humanitarian system? And what are the main challenges that you're focused on in your role? <laughs> uh, let's start off on a light note. No, thank you, Kareem. And it, it's wonderful to see you, colleagues, uh, and a real privilege to be here. Um, to speak to the humanitarian system today is to speak to a system that is strained, I do believe, to the point near collapse, but continues every single day to wake up all of us in this room, beyond this room, in Diro Balah and Gaza, through to Darfur and Sudan in order to ensure that we save lives. And we continue to do that. But we have found ourselves pulled in so many directions that it's incredibly difficult to focus. Because what we are faced with as humanitarians is failure of so many other parts of the world and so many other systems. We're faced with political failure. 
first and foremost and most immediately. And that has devastating consequences for the people who we serve. We're faced with development failure in many instances, which means that communities are not prepared for what is facing them, including in light of the global climate crisis. But in the face of that, we have tried to do all that we can. And the question that we face now is, have we tried to do too much? Because as we have stretched, as we have strained, as we have pulled ourselves in a thousand directions, because there was need, we never pulled ourselves in a direction where there wasn't need. I do sincerely believe this. But we pulled ourselves in a thousand direction because we saw a need. We now face ourselves a funding crunch that is dramatic. Last year was the first year in more than a decade that we received less humanitarian funding than the year before. In net terms, we'd always had a growing proportional gap, always, but we had not come off and down the other side of an increased trajectory. Last year we did. This year is scarier. And as we face that, and as we face a world where compassion is increasingly scarce as people, not because they don't want to be compassionate, but in many parts of the world are facing their own challenges, their own crises, we are faced with a situation where humanitarian funding is going to go down even more. And that means difficult decisions. So what does that look like? It looks like challenging us on whether we really are serving the people and the places who need us most. In some ways, we stretched ourselves almost to the brink of collapse to become a safety net that was not sustainable. And the question is, as we did that, did we serve the women in Eastern DRC in the way that we should have as they were displaced last year? Not once, not twice, but three times. Did we serve the people of El Fasha, the children who are dying of acute malnutrition every two minutes, in the way that we should have? Did we serve the people of Gaza in the way that we should have? And I believe that the answer is not that we didn't try, but that we were pulled in so many directions that we struggled. So the positive, Karim, the positive is that humanity remains strong. And that sounds like a cliche, but I say this having come from five weeks in Gaza in December and January, having come from surge at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, having worked in the responses to tropical cyclones across Southern Africa. And what stands out the most? That communities will stand up in a time of crisis. Before we're there, after we're there, communities will stand up in a time of crisis. I'll never forget going to Malawi after Cyclone Freddy and this incredible group of young people, doctors, social workers, lawyers, had come together to serve people who were affected. So communities are standing up. Humanity is not lost in Gaza when our truck got struck who came to rescue us it was the people who were themselves under fire with shelling just a couple of hundred meters away it was the people themselves who came to dig us out of a trench that we couldn't get out of because of an airstrike so humanity is there the question is how do we support it and we have to challenge ourselves on whether we're doing it in the right way in the right places at the right time and with the humility that we need as we bring our contribution. Thanks. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, Gemma. And thank you for sort of giving us some glimmers of hope here amid a, a, a otherwise difficult and depressing picture. I want to come to Minako next, if I can, to maybe build upon and expand what Gemma has highlighted. Minako, in your role at UNDP, you lead a team that is focused on anticipating risks. So how do you think about risk in the humanitarian context? And in particular, what kinds of risks do you think humanitarians need to be aware of when we consider the possible futures of the next five to 10 years? Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the I think Wendy's presentation was quite inspirational, um, looking at this chaos and then complex uh, perspective to the risks. And then Gemma, I think your point about if our system is fitting to the purpose, I think system was made in the past. Uh, back then, I think it was fitting to the purpose because given that the world is rapidly changing and becoming more complex and then cha chaotic, at least more manifesting on the surface, the way we work, either from the humanitarian or development perspective, like I think it's also giving 
as the opportunity to reflect how better we can work in the different contexts. And then perhaps that's not necessary in the development context and the crisis com context anymore, because I think the world is so much in the poly crisis uh, status, and we really need to look at uh, the risks from very much compounded perspectives. So right now, um, as UNDP, we are taking de-risking um, de of development is a key determinant in the fragile setting. Because I think we can all agree that to achieve the SDG would be not realistic anymore with the given situation. So we really need to challenge ourselves how we look up risks. So risks are compounded in the complex system. So we try to see the risks from the two lenses. The first one is systemic risk, which are associated with the country's economy, society, environment, and the governance. And then the second one is proximate risks, which are rapidly emerging and then significant changes that would trigger the fragility in the short to medium term. So therefore, our focus right now is to support the programming countries in anticipating the risks and introducing preventive action. And then when the crisis occurs, accelerating our recovery. But then coming back to our own lens and the decolonization of the way of looking at the situation, we are also self-critical. Are we fit for the purpose, not only just the development of humanitarian system, but also organizational culture? I think we are so siloed and fragmented even within the organization, so data information scattered. Uh, we can really have this linkage with the data to more quality analysis that would trigger action and supported the implementation and then learn from that as sort of like from the experimentation. So it's really about the behavior change and the cultural change needed within our system. And, and I think it's an opportunity for us to reflect the way we are working within the organization and within the system and then broadly uh, between also development and the humanitarian system. Thank you. That's a great that's a great answer. And I think you touched on some of those. The breaking down of silos is really what we're trying to do here, I think, with with this event. And, and I look out at this audience. I mean, there's so many people from the development, the humanitarian side, private sector and otherwise. And it's great that we can start to address these. You touched on some of the systemic risks in the humanitarian system. And Gemma highlighted that last year was the first year in, in a very long time that humanitarian funding went down. And so, Natalie, I'm going to put you on the spot here next. <laughs> you know, the Netherlands has long been known as one of the, the most consistent and generous donors to the humanitarian system. That's, that's been a fact for many, many years. But as with many countries around the world, I think it's fair to say that we're entering into a period of donor fatigue. So I wanted to ask you how you think about risks around humanitarian financing. And to put a fine point on it, why should the Dutch people fund humanitarian assistance for people caught up in crises in other countries around the world? Hmm. Okay, I thought your question was challenging. <laughs> but I rephrased that. I think my, my question is also challenging. Um, well, first of all, I would really like, uh, I'd like to thank you for the invitation because I, it's, it's very dear to my heart and I'm very happy to be here. And I'm, I'm also very happy when I look into the audience to see you all because this is a really diverse audience. Uh, which is great because I think, I, I don't know, you were alluding to that, you were alluding to that. We can only address all the difficult questions together. So now we are sitting here, the three of us, trying to provide answers for very difficult questions. But I think we're all here because we all want to answer uh, these questions. So what about the donor side? Well, I'm not going to explain Dutch politics to you because I don't know if you if you would really like to deep dive into it uh, for all of you who live here and work here, um, uh, do do ask your uh, Dutch friends to give you an update. Um, but what I would like to say, because I was also posted in Geneva for five years, and what I would like to say is that as donors, we, we do have a lot of discussion on uh, what's happening. And what's happening is, as you described, uh, more and more donors also have difficulty finding the amount of money because the amount of donors does not increase. So we're for, I, I'm 26 years now with Foreign Affairs indeed, and um, it's the same group of donors. Um, 
Um, but it's not that the others don't care. And it's also, I don't think we're losing our compassion. So I, I don't really go with the fatigue. And just to illustrate, over this weekend, my youngest son, who is going to turn 20 end of this month, is going to do, um, he's, he's going to be the chair of a, of, a, of a committee in his student life. And he said, mom, we're always collecting money throughout the year that we want to give to some good purpose. And, uh, and of course, he knows my work and he thought maybe I can give him a good pur- purpose. So I was texting him back. So what are you thinking about? You know, should it be in the environmental scene or humanitarian or for refugees? Or what are you thinking about? And he said, as long as we can see that our money made the difference. I'm like, hey. This is interesting, right? Because we're discussing systems and is the system functioning and it's complex and it's multi-complex and it's multi-crisis and we're not giving the right answers. And the only simple thing that he gave me this weekend was, is my money working? And it was a positive thing. That was not like, is there fraud and is there this and is there that and we need more systems and more procedures and even more procedures and systems. No, I think it's what you do. You who are in the data collection. And I love it. I came in and I, I really want to review everything you said about f- understanding the future and where did the new change start. Well, hopefully it starts here today because hopefully you can see the trends. And I know that, you know, data takes you back to what we have done because that's what you collect the data on. But still, there is always a movement from one point of data to another point of data. And then what happened and what was the context and why did it change and what can it tell us? And so maybe you can find these points of change and maybe that can help because if we don't change the system, we're going to keep telling each other that there's not enough funding, that we're fatigued. Well, I don't think we are, but we just also don't know where it should come from, that we are overstretched and it's all true, but it doesn't give the, it doesn't give us the upbeat energy to try and find where we want to go. And I think it's really important, last thing I want to say about it, and I think it's really important to look better at all the different kind of risk and then uh, invest in reducing the risk, which is a very difficult discussion for donors. Because imagine you're the minister and you have to go to parliament and you're going to say, I'm going to spend half of my development uh, corporation money into the risk that uh, are going to create big crisis. But if I address them early, uh, it's we're preventing a lot, right? That's what we all understand. But they always want to know, is that true? Because otherwise the money was unwell spent. So how can we explain? And I mean, we're the Netherlands and we're building, we're keeping our country safe for like the biggest crisis, which in our case is uh, is a water crisis and a flooding. And we're keeping ourselves safe and we're putting loads of money into it. And we have somehow explained to the people that it is worth the public money to uh, not drown and have a risk of one in thousand years. So how can we now explain that also for our development money, it's so important to invest in reducing the risk? Because otherwise the needs will just keep growing. So I don't know. So you have to look into the data and the trends and also the public support. And you, you have to look in a lot of different data sets and combine it and tell me what are the points of intervention. I know you can. It's a really great point. And I love the story about your son and the fundraising. I mean, we hear that from donors often of, of many different types. Nobody wants to be investing in a lost cause. People want to understand that their money is going to address the issues and they want to understand how it's helping. Gemma, raised some questions about whether we're doing too much as a humanitarian system. And Minako, you also highlighted that finding that money can get difficult. We have to think about ways that we can address these risks. For us in the humanitarian system, for many years now, we've been saying that anticipatory action programming and disaster risk reduction can help to get ahead of crises before they escalate, can help to produce a more efficient and effective humanitarian response down the line. And so Gemma and Minako, I'd actually like both of you to expand on this a little bit. What role do you think that anticipatory action and disaster risk reduction programming can play for a humanitarian system of the future? (laughs) 
actually wanted to go back to your perspective. And then I, I like those uh, two perspectives of like, we are actually human. And then this humanity and the human element is probably quite important to really nudge ourselves from data point to actions. And then I think one is the quality data, of course. But at the same time, even with all the quality data and then analysis there, I think it's very difficult for a decision maker to make the decision. I think there should be more human element to back the decision making, but also to support with through the implementation to show the evidence. And then there I see the storytelling and then sort of like narrative, like narration around this decision making is quite important to nudge. I think we tend to accept simple and lower risk than complex and then higher risks. I think that would hamper us to make any decision before anything happened. So I think there should be the way to look at more behavior science based, like, you know, um, the reasoning uh, for decision making. And then I think humanity and, humanity and the human elements in the anticipatory action is probably very important and that should be embedded within the system. I think it's not rigid in human system, but I think it should be very much human centered system that would allow us to move from more kind of rigid silo um, vertical system to more kind of quick and then um, versatile and dispatchy organization that I see as kind of like general overview and maybe not to this, but I'm, I would be happy to talk a little bit more about kind of preventive action, but I will hand over to you, Gemma. Okay. Um, those of you who know me well know I love this topic. <laughs> Um, no, what to say? I think there's a there's a few pieces here. I want to I want to pick up on what you've just said, um, which is number one about the human element, and the second piece I want to pick up on is on the type of crises that we're faced with today. So I remember a couple of years ago, and I was just telling Luke um, from IFRC who I was on the train with this morning, this as well, that I was having a conversation with a colleague who worked on anticipatory action, and I was explaining my concerns about it. And that colleague looked at me and said, Gemma, it's unethical not to believe in anticipatory action. <laughs> to which I said, do you really think I want to act late and cost more money and do things badly? No. But what are the challenges that we face in this space? They are many. Number one, the principle that we should act early, that we should prevent as much as possible. I don't think anyone in this room would disagree with, at least I hope we wouldn't. But how do we do that in a meaningful way when? The climate is changing. Having worked in Southern and Eastern Africa for eight years, um, from 2015 through to, through to just before I arrived in Geneva, the climate changed even in the time that I was there. The types of crises, the severity of crises, the way they unfolded, what the trajectory of the cyclones looked like. Any of us who worked on Cyclone Idai know it looked like a, an absolute maniac. Um, it had a pattern no cyclone had ever had before. So the climate is changing the way that climate crises play out is changing. Number two, the conflicts that we are dealing with are intense, are severe, and are characterized by things that take us back, not forward in the way that we respond. What do I mean by that? I mean sitting in Gaza with not a single means of communicating with anyone on my team where they were, where I was, what we were doing, if we were safe in one of the most high velocity conflicts of our lifetime. So the crises we are facing are challenging. So what role can anticipatory action play? It can help us in particular with the crises that are more predictable droughts, getting out in front of them, but it doesn't help us once we're into the fifth season of the most severe drought that the Horn of Africa has ever faced. It gets us through that first part and that's important doesn't mean it's not meaningful, but it means it has a limit. It can help us try and do better based on what we know of floods and cyclones and otherwise try and do better and do things that we know are good to do regardless of the cyclones path. Giving someone multi-purpose cash ahead of a shock that may or may not materialize, you're never going to regret it. It's always going to help someone. So this piece of acting early, acting with no regrets is hugely important, but let us not be fooled by two things. One is data does not solve everything. At the end of the day, we're talking about the, the fact that things are changing and they're changing fast. I think Wendy used the terms chaos and complexity. That's what we're living in. So it's not entirely predictable. And I think she urged us not to use the term predictability, which I think is really advisable. 
Um, and the second one is knowing that even when we act early, that's not going to be enough because the crises we're facing are so massive that they require acting early and acting the whole way through. Would you like to come in on that? Of course, yes, yes, get, because indeed this is uh, very dear to my heart and I, I very much agree with you that we also have to put the human element and the narrative there because um, if you don't, if you can, cannot share the story, you can never get support for why you do what you do and, 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 and as you said, some interventions will be good anyway. So um, um, how, how do we tell that and how do we make that clear? I just wanted to give an example, if, if I may, because I think that's the best way in which I can express maybe some of the donor thinking behind this. Um, so yes, data alone is not going to, to solve it, but it's very needed. And we live in a time in which we uh, have a lot of d data. Um, so at a certain point in my uh, Geneva time, the World Meteorological Organization said, we have so much data and we want to really strengthen uh, metrological organizations in different countries because this data can help. Because indeed, some of the natural uh, uh, disasters can be predicted because we have all this weather data and we have the weather patterns and, and we know the climate is changing. But we have a lot of, of, of data. But I had had so many discussions with the Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent, and I thought they are on the ground and they are putting the sandbags every time, you know, maybe a cyclone hits or when uh, when they see that there is a, a next drought, they, they're already trying to think, what can we do in order to bring people into safety? Uh, where is the shelter? Where is the food? So I thought, why is this now happening in these silos? Uh, because the IFRC is now strengthening the national societies to, let's say, put the sandbags there. The World Meteorological Organization is actually using satellites. So I said, how can we connect the satellites to the sandbags? And that became the working name for a process that took a while, I must admit. It's also not so easy if you're a donor and you have different budget lines and you have different, uh, well, I won't go into the procedures that we have as donors, but um, let me assure you, we have a lot of procedures because we need to account for, of course, the money spent. But we need to connect the satellite to the sandbags, which actually meant we had to use the lens of the risk. So we put UNDRR in the middle. So we said, please, um, WMO, IFRC and UNDRR come up with a plan of how you can jointly use that data. It's just an example because I think there are so many parts of the system that can work together well and that can share information and that can look for each other's complementarity. And then we, the donors, have to find ways that we fund the cooperation and what it does. So finally, we found a way because was, this was also part of, the, of the, the, the obstacles that we faced. But finally, we found a way to get that financed as well. Um, because normally, you know, you have to finance different organizations. But we said, no, we want to finance the fact that they work together and how they program together. So they program together now in four countries. And I think it's so worthwhile because already sitting together and seeing what is the type of data that the WMO and the National Meteorological Organization provides us with and what's actually the experience and the knowledge that the national society has and how is that built into policies to really do disaster risk reduction. And I think it is really good that they uh, speak each other's language now. Um, because I think that was also very uh, interesting in the beginning because they were all speaking English to each other, but they were meaning different things by using the same words. Um, so so I think is is something that donors can do, maybe push for more cooperation to address a very specific connection between, uh, well, in this, say, in this case, the satellites to the sandbags, but it can also be another type of connection um, that you really want to tackle a specific problem and that you look, how is it connected and how can we really zoom into that instead of compartmentalize it and then finance it from different angles. So really great comments from all three of you. Thank you. And, and you're right. I mean, breaking down silos, making use of data, figuring out how to tell better stories, empowering decision makers. These are all things that I know the center and the team at the center have been working on for a number of years now, but it's clear that we need to accelerate this kind of work. And 
I think from all three of you, we've heard some glimmers of positive change in the humanitarian system. So why don't we run with that? <laughs> As we heard earlier from Wendy, in order to achieve the vision that we want for a more positive humanitarian system, we need to be able to articulate it. And so with that in mind, I want to ask all three of you the same question now, and perhaps we can start with Monaco and go down the line. If you were to imagine a thriving humanitarian system in 10 years time, or five to 10 years time, what would that positive outcome look like? And what would be some signs of success? Um, perhaps I'm uh, repeating myself and then uh, the colleagues, uh, the input. Um, I want to highlight actually two things. I think one is anti system and then also for prevention. And then I will not repeat um, why it's important and then how, how we can work around this. Perhaps one element is it's quite experimental. Um, as, um, as you mentioned, I think it's very much connecting the dot. And then that's the work of the connecting the dot could be different from context to context. So I think a lot of learning coming out and we are not really encouraged to test, experiment and then learn from that um, our experience of the anti work. So perhaps I think one suggestion and then um, the, the ideal situation in 10 years time is to have sort of like a knowledge sharing platform, not necessarily just data and then good practices, like failure, like how we couldn't make this anti action. What went wrong? Was it the analysis? Was it uh, this disconnections of analysis and an action? Is it action and implementation? Because we also admit that um, our system is quite rigid when it comes to implementations. I am speaking about, for instance, UNDP. We sometimes struggle with the procurement, uh, quick procurement on the ground, right? And then um, there are so many feedback and comment coming up from, from the ground. But we are not really reflecting uh, to the anti work. So I think the existing system is not necessarily fit for anti work and then we, we need to be allowed to do more experimental work and then learning from that. And so it, it would be great to have that kind of platform or the system that allow us to, to do failure also and then learn from it. Um, the second one is uh, the strengths in the local ownership. I think the strong wisdom now with this recurring crisis, um, either natural disaster or conflict, I think they are really rich wisdom and an understanding in the local communities. And then I think it's important that we really reflect ourselves again to really put the local community in the center of either um, assessment, uh, data collection, and then I think the ownership of that is should be by local community. So really like this decolonizing the way we look at, um, I think we should really put ourselves and then making them in the center for um, the needs assessment, uh, consultation, engagement, and then in a more collective manner, not that each agency or each organization goes to uh, to same community, but in the way that we also integrate our work to engage with the community and then putting community in the center would be, I think it has been already there, but I think it's more and more important with the given uh, given situation. What would a more thriving humanitarian system? Yeah, ten years. Um, I was really struck by what you said that you were in Gaza, which is incredibly uh, heavy. That must have been incredibly heavy, and that you were not able to communicate even and know if everybody was in safety. And I thought, you know, in the end, that's what we all want. If you say what is a well-functioning humanitarian system, and how would you measure that? That would be that people are safe. Uh, that's like primary and then are healthy and you know that's I think every person and that's also what you said humanity is there and and the human being should should be in the center and this is something that everybody needs um, and and hopefully also wants for another person um, but that's of course why we all maybe are in this like jobs that we have because we think that's kind of like logical that you that you would want that. So how would you reach that? I think it's really important to to look at what's happening locally and contextualize that. And you you also said, you know, it's the people that are already living there where the disasters take place or a conflict starts. 
uh, they live through that, uh, hopefully survive it, and then they have to rebuild and reconstruct. And so, so to really understand um, and value what their knowledge is of the situation and what the what their what their way of coping is, maybe because there's a lot of needs. But how can we maybe uh, have a discussion on how how will you cope? And what will you need for that? Which also means some kind of um, more flexible approach because uh, donors do have huge discussions on cash and if it's uh, effective. But everybody has different ways of coping and dealing with situation and what they need because a family with only girls is, has different needs than a, a family with um, that's taking care of the elderly, so to speak, you know. So... So I think, um, yeah, you need to see the trends, but you also need to be flexible and contextualize. And you really, it needs to, to come from that, uh, the, the local knowledge. Um, just one more thing. Maybe I was also involved in the UN Water Conference, uh, which uh, the Netherlands co-hosted with Tajikistan. And at, after a few months into preparing, we all came to the understanding that actually indigenous knowledge is so worthwhile when it comes to water and the use of water. And there's so many methods that are with indigenous uh, people all around the world on how to deal with uh, the um, and, uh, too much and too little water. Um, so, so I thought, yeah, really listen to each other. And, and, and the world is complex and we're always running and we, we don't have a lot of time. But we, indeed, we have so much data. And if we also have the good maybe discussion and we also listen well, I think maybe if we can combine that, that we can fix things. But it needs us to be a little bit more flexible, put different lenses to it and really put the people that it's about the people. So really put them at the center of what we're doing. So I'll pick up uh, right where you left off. I think number one, what would we want to see? Really a humanitarian system where the people who are affected by crises are at the center. And I've reflected a lot on this, um, especially in these last couple of years. And even the way that we, you're all here to talk about data. Sometimes the way that we use data is itself dehumanizing. When you take the stories of 2.3 million individuals and say it's 2.3 million people affected, we erase the humanity of every single one of those people because they become a number. So how do we really put people at the center and how do we really connect that humanity? I think that's, that's number one. And that's not easy because it requires a fundamental acknowledgement. We, when we talk about decolonization, this is really big. This requires not othering people who are in crisis, which by the way, we shouldn't be doing because now the whole world is in crisis, um, but not treating this as something that happens to the other and not treating people who are affected by crisis as the other, treating them as equal, hearing them as equal and acknowledging their inherent worth. And I was on a call um, not too long into the beginning of the Sudan crisis, and we had an incredible IOM colleague who was briefing on their DTM. I've just given two acronyms in the space of two seconds, statistics. And and she she got halfway through her briefing, and then she started crying, and I hope she won't mind me saying this. I'm not using her name. And she said, I'm really sorry. My uncle is a couple of kilometers from the border because she was briefing about the people who were trying to flee Sudan and who were stuck. Um, south of the, the Egyptian border and her uncle was there and that said more than all of the numbers the brilliant numbers and the amazing presentation that she had given but it stopped everyone in their tracks why because we're talking about a person not a nameless faceless number that's impacted by a crisis so I think this builds on what you've both said but really really in, and not in a cliche way but really figuring this out how do we put people at the center and how do we acknowledge people for being who they are? The second one you've already touched upon, but I want to be really clear about this. Safe. Want it to be safe, both for the people who are impacted by crises and even if that's not realistic, then for the people who are responding. Our colleagues in Yemen are abducted. Our colleagues in Gaza are killed. Our colleagues in Sudan are attacked. This is not acceptable. And if you ask me tomorrow, let alone five years, 10 years, it's, re it's 
revitalizing, regaining the acceptance of humanitarian action as something that must exist to help people in need, no matter who is controlling the area, no matter what is happening in that crisis. We do not have that today. And really acknowledging who is the most in danger, who are mostly the people from the communities who are working in their own communities um, to serve. But safe is the second one. Third is well-resourced. And here I say this, not as a jab at our donors, but actually as part of a bigger reflection because it's well-resourced and depoliticized. And the two of those things don't necessarily go hand in hand. They may, in fact, contradict each other. But one of the things you said with your example of your son, we looked at data from the UK. More people gave more individually in the United Kingdom than the government of the United Kingdom gave for assistance. Just to say the people of the world, be that a person, I was when I was on the train last night, I shared the, the cabin with a phenomenal Ukrainian artist who's a refugee now living in Germany. And she spoke about when she was fleeing um, from Kharkiv uh, to, the, to the West, families along the way opening their doors. When I say well-resourced, it means acknowledging everyone has a role to play in giving. And when I say depoliticized, it means we are faced with a fearsome prospect right now. And Gaza exemplifies it, embodies it, speaks to it, that unless we can get beyond our current funding dynamic, humanitarian action will not be seen as representative of humanity. So well-resourced and depoliticized and all of that grounded in solidarity. Because what are we looking at? We're looking at a world in chaos. We're looking at a world in crisis. And I look at my own country, Australia, and one of the proudest moments I ever had, horrifying as it was, was there were bushfires that were approaching near where I grew up. And there were firefighters on the ground from everywhere, from Papua New Guinea to Canada, to support the Australian firefighters in responding. So we speak about localizing responses, and that is important, but it's also about internationalizing solidarity. Thanks. Thank, thanks to all three of you for really articulating what a thriving humanitarian system could look like, a more anticipatory, a more preventative system, a system that helps us to connect the dots and make sense of various data sources. I highlighted a more experimental, no regrets attitude that allows for failure and learning, something that we still aren't very good at, at least acknowledging our failures and trying to learn from them. We, we heard you all emphasize local leadership and ownership ensuring that more people around the world are safe and healthy, a more flexible and context-driven system that leverages local knowledge and local resources, that puts affected people at the center, that centers humanity, our shared humanity and stories. And really, I think, Gemma, bringing it all home and revitalizing humanitarian standards and principles, seeing a more well-resourced system that is depoliticized and just a more humane world. I mean, I think we can all agree that those would be signs of a, of a much better humanitarian system than what we have today. These are all great suggestions. And as you know, OCHA itself is in the midst of a leadership transition with the Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, Martin Griffiths, stepping down at the end of this month. So with that in mind, and thinking about this very extensive list of factors on what a, a, a better humanitarian system might look like, what advice might you give to the incoming Undersecretary General about what her top priorities should be. I hope. <laughs> but what, what steps can, uh, can OCHA's leadership and, and the humanitarian leadership around the world take to help us enable this, this vision of the future? Uh, Gemma, you asked me not to pick on you there, so maybe we'll start with Minako. <laughs> you want to go with this? <laughs> Tell my That's new boss my fault. I said it. <laughs> no, um... Listen, I think that there's a few pieces here, and I actually discussed this with Martin um, on Friday. So I've told the outgoing one, so I can easily tell the incoming one as well. I'm going to say something that a lot of people in the humanitarian system find very controversial. And that is that I do sincerely believe we need to challenge ourselves on whether we are serving the people and places who need us most. I really do believe we need to challenge ourselves. Um, because because of what we have been through, because we have stretched, because we have strained, we need to now, I believe, especially with the funding situation as it is, really take stock and say, 
with these scarce resources that we have, are we serving the people and the places who need us most? We're doing technical work around this. We're looking at how we set boundaries and everything else. And the flip side of this, uh, and, and Martin and I were discussing this in a meeting, is we need to partner with the, the people and the actors who can then do the work that we would no longer be doing. Be they governments who are duty bearers to their own people, be they development actors who are already doing interesting and exciting work in a lot of places. And we see, for example, the World Bank in Afghanistan doing something that we've not seen anywhere else, which is to finance the provision of essential services in a way that doesn't happen. In Niger, development assistance was suspended across the Sahel. It's been suspended. So part of it is redefining what we do and where we are, and then giving equal energy to engaging with others who are doing the other parts of the puzzle to make sure they all fit together. And that is less about, from my view, sitting in the middle, which we've called the nexus and the continuum and the contiguum, and the, it's had a thousand names. It's less about sitting in the middle. It's more about that self-reflection on all sides of the puzzle around whether we're the pieces we need to be right now and do we fit together for the people who we serve. Um, so that's a really, really critical one because otherwise I don't believe that we will be able to do what we're doing today because, Karim, before I hand this over to others who will have more to say, um, I just want to say I often hear very broad brush criticisms of why do, we, why do we fund billions of dollars of humanitarian action a year? We should be changing things. We should be... All of that is true to a point, but the point is we fund humanitarian action to save lives. And that is not a small thing. And it's important that we critique ourselves, that we push ourselves to do more. So for that more finite group of people and places that I believe we need to orientate towards, then we can deliver a more quality response. But let's also not underestimate or devalue what all of our colleagues who are not in this room today are doing every day, most of them in conflict, which is waking up every day to try and save lives. That is valuable. It is. So how do we redirect that energy, that effort, and the scarce resources we have to the people and places who need it most? That's the biggest question that I believe the incoming USG is faced with, together with everything we've discussed around decolonization, which I won't rehash. Thank you very much for that excellent answer. Minako, would you like to weigh in on this subject, advice for the incoming USG? I think I, I want to actually recap um, your previous point of like, really returning to the key principle and of humanitarian and development support. I think it's not something that we are inventing now, but I think there are lots of like thought and the practices in the past. And I think when we went this far, and then probably we are not really meeting the key principle that have been agreed upon in the past. So the oldest humanitarian development key principle, I think recapturing that in the current context would be one priority I would suggest. And then the second is um, moving away from project oriented, like single agency or single organization project type to more integrated and then multi sectoral approach. And then I think that is really to meet I mean, to address the key challenges, of course, resources and et cetera. But I think the point is about really local community in the center. If we see them in the center, then naturally all these different issues around them are all connected in the complex system. So unless we work together, we can't really address the different risks. So I think from that perspective of local community and then people in concern, I think we really need to move away from single agency or project-based approach. That's second. The third one is, um, I actually I agree with you, it's a partnership. Again, I think there are emerging uh, potential partners. Private sector is one. IFI, um, the new donors. I think we see the new dynamics and then I think in the way politicize also um, the funding situation. I think we see that in also the funding and the new donor situation. So how much we can take the leverage of those uh, new coming and then also existing like private sector key financing and the new way of financing 
but at the same time, through the engagement with the, the emerging donors and then partnership, like how we can also address the politicization of the the funding and the resources. I think there will be opportunity by looking at partners in the different lens. And I think multi sectorism is also there um, in this third uh, priority. It's great. Thank you, Renako. That's the head of our private sector unit. I, I agree very much with you about uh, diversifying our partner base. But Nathalie, without putting you in trouble with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, maybe you can share with us what, what priorities you might ask the incoming Undersecretary General to focus in on. Yeah, my thoughts were going everywhere, and especially to a lunch that uh, the UK ambassador in Geneva hosted when Martin started. So, um, and he had he was full of plans, and and one of the things that he really wanted was also to actually address the politicization. Um, and then more and more crisis came, and uh, now he's uh, he's 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 leaving. And I would first like to say a big big uh, gratitude to, to him and all the staff for, for everything uh, that you've all put um, put up with and through uh, because it only got worse actually in the world. That's how we started. So then when a new, uh, when a, when somebody new comes in, I think, I think all of us should give more room to the, the role and the mandate of OCHA. And that's something that we've been saying so many times. Uh, but I really mean it because you can give more staff, more data, but the, the real problem is there's no incentive in the system that allows OCHA to do what it needs to do, and that's to make others work together and address the problem and actually work complementary, give the right data, give the right approach, and be somehow both the platform as well as the umbrella. And I think if the system doesn't grow up, and doesn't give OCHA and the uh, and, uh, incoming person, <laughs> uh, the successor to Griffiths, uh, that space. Uh, and it stays in some kind of a competing way. Because think about it, think about this uncle who might or might not have crossed in safety. What does he care if, if he's bleeding and he's hungry? What does he care if it's WHO, WFP, uh, sorry, UNDP or OCHA who stands there? You know, he just needs help. And so we really need to get our act together. And also we, the donors, I'm going to be very self-critical because I also think it's very stupid that donors compete with each other. And then you get the earmarking and the visibility and that's not making this system efficient at all. So I'm really also calling for unearmarked funding, which I probably also have to explain to a new minister, but that's going to be my task. <laughs> uh, it's something that I will just also keep striving for. But but I think we should really do that. I think we should really address it. As you said, it gets politicized. Uh, the incentives are not right. Um, the, the basic principles are not met. Uh, we fail with our terrible not having political solutions to the biggest problems and we make you, we, we send you everywhere to try and solve it. So I think just put it out there and, and, and make us responsible and try to make make us feel responsible that we share this and that we can do it together instead of really competing with each other. Thank you. Those are great suggestions. And and I think as Sarah mentioned, this is all being recorded. So we'll, we'll try and share some of this with the incoming leadership. I, I want to- Can I take that one sentence yeah. out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank all three of you for really sort of coming up with excellent answers to some very difficult questions. And I do have one last question for each of you, which I hope will be a little bit easier uh, as we transition now to, to sort of the breakout sessions and the rest of our program over the next two days. What is one advance that you are seeing today that gives you confidence that humanitarians will be able to step up to meet the growing needs of affected communities and the challenges of tomorrow? Is there one particular thing that gives you hope and gives you um, confidence that we'll be able to to come to this future that we've been trying to articulate. The resilience. I mean, every day we can be so depressed by reading the papers and 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 being called to help. And every day people do get up and do it. It's incredible. It's like truly incredible. I mean, there's so much. Uh, resilience in in every one of us, and especially the people uh, 
that go through that go through different types of crisis because there are a lot of different types of crisis. And I think to just also reach out to each other and ask each other how are you doing, um, you know, what do you need? I think that's that's like the the basic uh, the basics of of the hope that 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 we will somehow manage and keep going. Can I, maybe I'll build on that. Um, I think the hope is the colleagues who wake up every day and do this in the hardest places. And they wake up every day and they keep doing it. And I've seen it in every crisis I've responded to. And you've all seen it. And that is hope, right? We we are always afraid of lionizing humanitarians and we're worried about making heroes of ourselves. But the reality is that the colleagues who I've worked alongside um, if I think of the Palestinians in Gaza who I worked alongside and, and the people who, uh, let me just give you one very concrete example. Um, on Christmas Day, there was a horrifying airstrike on a, on a place called Marazi. It's in the middle of, um, it's in the middle of Gaza. And we went the day after the airstrike, um, and I went with a WHO team to a point of, it doesn't matter who it matters that we're together and delivering. And I was speaking to the driver um, and I said, listen, don't worry, you don't need to come inside because if I could convey what was inside, the war would have ended um, the day after it began. So I can't accurately or, or enough convey what was there. But I said, you don't need to see that. And he turned to me after we stopped driving. Um, and he said, Gemma, 50 of my family members were killed yesterday. And he had still gotten up that morning to drive us to the hospital in the area where his family members were killed. So if you ask about hope, and that is one, you could go through Sudan and Yemen and Syria where people are still showing up after 13 years. So that is hope. And as we're afraid of lionizing humanitarian action, um, let us not be afraid of acknowledging that incredible heroism of a lot of our colleagues who are doing this in the face of literal threat to their own lives. So that's one. And the second one is I want to give another example of something that was just wonderful. Recently on the margins of the ICFA conference in Geneva, I ran into a colleague, an amazing man, Reverend John. He runs a local NGO in South Sudan. I was there uh, working with him 2015 to 17. The day before I left Juba, I went to see him at his office and they had Six Star, Six Star, a wonderful organization doing incredible work. And when I saw him on the margins of the ICFA conference, he said, Gemma, guess how many staff I have today? And I said, oh, Reverend John, I'd say probably 20. And he said, over 200. <laughs> um, so there is, there is hope and there are people across this world who are delivering humanitarian action in the most meaningful way. And many of them are not getting the support they need the safety they need or the funding they need, but they are continuing to do it. That is hope. Those are great answers. The resilience and the bravery of, of affected people, of humanitarian workers on the ground, um, I think it gives us all hope. And Munako, I'll, I'll leave it with you for the final word here. What gives you hope for the future? Thank you very much. I will build up on uh, the colleague's point. Um, so I was also in, and I, I stayed in Syria for six years, so I could walk through um, the different challenges that um, the, the teams and the colleagues uh, went through, uh, national colleagues. And then the, when the earthquake hit, this uh, Turkey-Syrian earthquake hit, it was quite impactful um, and it was really shaking like emotionally the national colleagues. And then I found it, I found the narrative of the colleague were, um, were quite inspirational. Um, many colleagues told me, that we managed 13 years with the conflict, like, you know, more violence and like the incident, but we never expected the mother ours would, would finally, you know, give this, uh, like verdict on us. So they took it as kind of like fatalism. And, but I also felt the very, like on the opposite side, very strong connections of the people and then the land. Um, it's not like state or like nation. It's really about the land, the connectivity of people and an environment and the mother earth. And then it was coming out from more negative uh, connotation. But I also felt that is the hope that, you know, we have that the connectivity 
with the ecosystem and then with the the arts and then I think that could be strong foundation for us to rebuild and then really like rebuild around our resilience and then remember that we are not just the human like we are connected to also the environment and the mother earth and then at the same time I've seen the um the differences among the different communities affected by earthquake so the community affected in Aleppo had better coping compared to the one in other uh, the governorate because they went through so difficult destruction and then at the time. So I think crisis also posed such a learning and a rebuilding opportunity for us to be further resilient and then also connect the the community. It's like much stronger to rebuild and then survive. So I think this resilience also coming out from like even like beaten and stronger uh, in the time of the crisis. And then that's I felt as a hope. It's not that just they went through the difficult time. They even had a strong coping mechanism to respond to the earthquake. And then that was giving me the hope. And the last point is about, um, we also want to acknowledge a lot of improvement done in the humanitarian system. And then I think we we tend to be very self-critical, but we also want to acknowledge and then celebrate how like past ten years have really changed and then made us like better and improved, including this uh, um, the you know this uh, data around data, but also uh, based on the humanitarian um, the world humanitarian day, this triple nexus and then cash came out and then look at how much it's being practiced. And then I, it's not just because I'm coming from the UNDP, but I really see this triple nexus is also the way to unpack, to look at the different risks and then also be preventive. And that's being practiced. And indeed, um, Syria is one of the good example. So I also want to celebrate what has been done and the rebuild, not just to being too self-critical and then really look at uh, what has been done and build upon uh, for the future. Thank you so much. And Minako, Nathalie, Gemma, thank you very much for sharing with us your insights.